Good evening from my Beach. It's Dr. John Bennett broadcasting for Neurosurgical TV. We're honored to have the third mm -hmm. week of the Achieving Mastery in Aneurysm Microneurosurgery with Allie Christ and Mike Lawton. And I'll turn it right over to Allie. Welcome, Allie. Thank you, John, and uh, welcome to everyone, to all the new ones and everybody who's coming back uh, for Encore. And this is our third week. Today, we're going to discuss the anterior communicating artery aneurysms. They're the uh, uh, most common to present with a rupture. They uh, kind of need some tricks. They have certain complexities to them. But uh, just like all the other aneurysms, if you get your plan right, uh, things should usually go well in the majority. So as we have done before, uh, uh, Dr. Lawton Michael will be starting his first 30 minutes, and then I'll give another 30 minutes, after which we'll have a short uh, kind of uh, time for some discussion and questions. Dr. Abud will choose some of the good questions to, that will cover more uh, or less uh, pertinent things related to what we've said. Uh, Michael, Dr. Lotun just told me that he had surgery to do. He may have to leave after his talk. So uh, uh, we'll forgive you and uh, uh, we'll kind of continue with, with my talk afterward. If he plans changes and comes back, that will be great too. And uh, Again, Michael needs no introduction, and uh, I'll let him get started so he can get to his case. Okay, I'm going to um, <clears throat> do my screen share here, and uh, let me make sure this goes right this time. All right, so... Um, are you seeing my uh, seven aneurysms slot, yeah, title slide? Yes, yeah, per perfect. And is it the presenter view or just the title, the one slide? Oh, uh, you know, Mike, I can't oh. tell. <laughs> no, no, this is the presenter view. Uh, no, no, the show. No, no, it's one slide. It looks oh, fine. Slide, yeah. Okay, perfect. Okay, well, um, so this is uh, week three, and uh, <clears throat> we're just working our way. Uh, down a list of uh, the common aneurysms. And uh, this is a big one. This is the anti communicating artery aneurysm. And um, let's just jump right to it. Um, it's um, um, an important one because uh, so many of the ruptured aneurysms that you'll see are ACOMs. And um, it's complicated anatomy. Here's a, um, a rotin uh, dissection showing all of the different uh, arteries in the ballpark. There are nine. Uh, or 11, depending on how many you include, uh, major arteries in this, um, in this complex here, and you really have to account for each and every one of these. So uh, jumping to it, um, you know, I think uh, knowing the uh, alphanumerics is a good place to start. Uh, the A1 is what leads into the ACOM. A2 is what leads out of the ACOM. The, um, these are the two major uh, segments in that list of the nine major arteries. Um, so that's four of them. The ACOM is the fifth. The um, sixth and seventh are the uh, recurrent arteries of Huebner. Um, the eighth and ninth are the orbitofrontals. And if you throw in frontal polars on top of them, uh, you've got 11. So uh, those are the, the arteries. And of course, we can't forget about the perforators on the ACOM itself. So this is the classic symmetrical ACOM complex. You can see all the arteries that we just mentioned. Um, this is what you'll see um, on many an uh, angiogram, but with aneurysms, you very frequently will see the <clears throat> asymmetrical ACOM complex where you've got a dominant A1, a hypoplastic one on the opposite side. And you'll also often see these uh, variations in um, anatomy. Here, the fenestration, and here uh, over to your bottom right is the accessory ACOM. So these are things to look for. Um, there are uh, just nuances as you're dissecting. You know, when you see uh, odd things, um, these are the things that you should think about so that they don't confuse you. Uh, there's some important 
variations that you'll see at the ACOM, um, one of which is the, uh, or the most important of which is the accessory A2, uh, the one on the lower left. The accessory A2 is important because if you go in expecting there to be just two A2s, and there's really three, then um, you will not have accounted for that extra artery and you could easily occlude it with your clips. So it's important to look for that up front. Uh, you can usually spot it. It's often um, more posterior than the other two. Um, sometimes the aneurysm splays them. So uh, you should look for that. And um, particularly when, you do, when you're doing your dissection, you've got to uh, find that and protect it. Sometimes the aneurysm will lie between the um, uh, A2 and the accessory A2. Sometimes it'll be between the uh, classic A2s and push the accessory back. Uh, you'll see all kinds of variations, but just knowing it's there is half the battle. In the middle is the azagus. Azagus means unpaired. And so uh, you can see this azagus ACA where there's a single A2 that comes out of the ACOM complex. Uh, these are very rare. Uh, more often you'll see aneurysms at this quadrifurcation more distally rather than at the ACOM itself, but something to look for as well. And then um, this bihemispheric ACA is important because if you've got an A2 that crosses over, uh, over the corpus callosum usually, splenium, uh, not splenium, but um, rostrum or uh, genu, um, you'll, you'll see um, that one side supplies branches to both sides and it's particularly important that you care for that uh, origin, that trunk. And it, it's often seen in association with an, a smaller one on the opposite side. Other things that um, are relevant for dissection, you can see twists in the ACOM. <coughs> so if you have rotation, uh, what that does is it throws one of the A2s forward, another, the other of the A2s back. And um, as you're approaching it from your subfrontal view, it's sometimes um, confusing when you've got that twist. You'll also see a twist um, uh, in the, um, uh, sorry, this is the twist in a different view. Uh, you'll also see the tilt, which means that the traditional horizontal axis of the ACOM can be tilted. And that too can um, bring one of the A2s down, the other one up, and uh, confuse the anatomy. Now, projection is really important. And um, a theme of this aneurysm is that um, there's tremendous variability. You see variability because of all the different anatomy we've been talking about, but also because um, different patterns of projection. There are four ones that I use to think about these. There's the um, superior, anterior, inferior, and posterior. And if you think about it in those four terms, then it um, affects the way that you dissect the aneurysm. So here is um, uh, the dance card. This is the, uh, the different steps that we take to, um, to approach a simple ACOM. Um, I like to get the A1 exposed so that I march out the artery that's going to give me control of the complex. I look for number two here. This is the A12 junction. Oftentimes, you'll see the recurrent artery first. It typically lies in front of the A1. So as you're coming subfrontally, you might see recurrent artery of Huebner first before you actually see A1. And you can follow Huebner back to the A12 junction. It takes you to um, a point just a millimeter or two distal to the ACOM. So uh, either way, uh, follow the A1 out or follow recurrent and find your A2. Once you find this A1, A2 angle here, uh, it, it defines, um, well, you're, you're completely safe in this area. There's really no aneurysm that projects into the space. They're usually, um, you're only gonna encounter aneurysm if you cross this line of the two of them. So, so finding the A2 is um, really orienting. It helps you identify uh, one of the two major targets uh, in the A2 and uh, keeps you out of the uh, pathway of the dome. The third step is to go across. You know, I like to get into this, what I call the pre-communicating triangle. It's the triangle of the A1s uh, on both sides. And if you get in the triangle and stay low, you can work your way across following the chiasm around to the contralateral optic nerve and you can find your contralateral A1. Number five is really um, getting above the aneurysm and looking across the inner hemispheric fissure. It means opening up the arachnoid between the frontal lobes, between the medial surfaces of the gyrus rectus, finding that A2 
two on the contralateral side, and then working your way down to the neck. Lastly is uh, just dissecting these perforators and really defining the neck anatomy uh, on both sides and uh, preparing for clipping. Now, um, the projection influences that. If you look at the inferiorly projecting aneurysm, and we've made these bigger just to show or exaggerate the point. Uh, you go one, two, three, and it's uh, pretty much the same, but it's number four is different. You can't see the contralateral A1. You've got to go up here because if you force it and go across the neck too early, you could um, uh, upset the dome and uh, precipitate a re rupture. So you want to get up here first, follow your way down, and then work your way across the top of the neck. This is what you want to save for the last, number six. Um, because that's where your second clip blade is going to go. Your first blade is going to go along the pathway of number five here. The second blade will go under here in the path of number six. And even if um, you don't get proximal control on the opposite side, number seven, you can still uh, clip this with um, adequate control unilaterally and get the job done. And the clip for that is typically just a straight clip right along the pathway of the ACOM and um, uh, usually is pretty straightforward. The only uh, areas where you get into trouble is if, um, if it's a hot aneurysm, if it's adherent to the optic nerve and you lift up on the frontal lobe with the retractor, or if you lift up uh, on the aneurysm with your dissection instrument, you could easily re-rupture it. Now, uh, for the anterior, <coughs> you can see some of our early steps are the same, uh, but um, for the anterior, you can usually slip under here cross the chiasm and get your proximal control of the contralateral A1. Um, then uh, this is more like the standard steps, which I showed you initially, going over the top, working your way down, and then uh, lastly, uh, dissecting the perforators. The anterior projector, uh, the perforators are on the opposite side of the complex. They're usually easy to see and, and preserve, so they're not um, terribly uh, challenging. And um, unlike some of the others we'll talk about, and the clip, again, is really a straight uh, uh, standard clip across uh, the line of the neck parallel to the ACOM. Now, the superior ones can be challenging because uh, with these, it's very difficult to see the contralateral A2. The aneurysm projects upwards. Uh, sometimes there's a little bit of a posterior portion of the dome or the fundus. And so um, finding that uh, contralateral A2 can be challenging. Uh, it's helpful to really uh, work your way from the A1 contralateral to the uh, uh, early portion of the A2 contralateral because a superiorly projecting aneurysm will give you a sense of where that contralateral A2 is going down on the low side. It's hidden on the high side here, so it's much harder to, um, to work your way uh, over the top. Uh, so for that, um, I open up what's called the junctional triangle. It's the triangle between the A1 and the A2 and gyrus rectus. You go over the shoulder of Huebner, not under the shoulder. If you go under and try and open up this space, you could very easily avulse Huebner. But if you go over the shoulder, you can get into this window and work your way across to the contralateral A2. And for these, um, you know, there are a lot of different ways you can treat uh, or clip these. You can use this tandem construct. You can use a um, fenestrated clip, or you can just use a straight clip if you can work the blades in properly. So a lot of different options for the superiorly projecting one, and that's a very common one. Lastly is this one, the posterior, and this one's challenging because um, as you see here, um, you can visualize all of your major arteries. They're in plain view, but um, what's difficult is visualizing perforators. These aneurysms push the perforators down. They're often stuck to the back underside. They can be draped over the top and stuck to the uh, top side as well. So um, you've got to um, take really good care. You can see everything, but the uh, pathway for the clip blade is a bit more challenging. And once again, <clears throat> the, uh, the junctional triangle is very useful for this, getting into this triangle here and opening that space. Here I've shown this uh, angled fenestrated clip um, or a straight fenestrated clip essentially fenestrating either the A1 or the A2. And uh, often for these posteriorly projecting aneurysms, that's a good way to go. Uh, lastly is just these fenestration tubes to keep in mind. Sometimes with ACOMs, you can stack fenestrated clips, uh, create a tunnel here for 
the A2 to travel through. And also if you've got uh, A2s that drop under uh, the aneurysm kind of coming out from underneath, you can make a fenestration tube with a closing clip here on the top, and that will uh, make this nice origin of the A2 for this one here. Uh, the dome fenestration tube is also useful. Um, uh, I've used that for um, um, ACOMs projecting superiorly, and you actually use a uh, what I call a reverse fenestration, um, or sorry, reverse picket fence, where you're fenestrating the ACOM itself, and the clip is actually um, going across the uh, the, the sac. So uh, let me show you some cases. Um, this is. Um, uh, a case uh, just to demonstrate an anteriorly projecting aneurysm and um, constructed images showing. Let, let this me uh, just make sure, sure that you're seeing the video. Is the video playing? Yes. Okay. All right. So um, this is the view um, that you get uh, in the subfrontal plane. Um, these are quick videos. They're uh, thought uh, it's more useful to show a lot of cases rather than uh, long videos, but here you can see a temporary clip's been placed. That softens the aneurysm. I'm hunting for that contralateral A2. You can see it over there on the contralateral side. And once you find that contralateral A2, you work your way down to the origin, and that really defines the pattern for the um, clip blade application. Um, the temporary clip is nice because it gives you some softening of the aneurysm. And uh, here's IC Green. Just uh, always uh, use this to confirm um, patency of the branch vessels. And here, um, just a, a puncturing of the dome. And finally, just a little understack mini clip for a little dog ear remnant uh, so that you can get every last bit of that um, aneurysmal tissue um, incorporated in the clips. So just a simple anterior projecting aneurysm showing or demonstrating some of those uh, things that we talked about. Uh, this one here, um, this is a uh, going to be a superiorly projecting aneurysm. So here um, uh, is the view uh, across the ACOM complex. The ipsilateral A1 is here. Uh, here we're looking uh, behind the aneurysm. You can see it's a very thick-walled um, aneurysm base. So we'll go on with a temporary clip to soften this. And um, with the aneurysm soft, it allows you to manipulate the aneurysm. And here, um, you'll see I've really got to pull this aneurysm out of the inner hemispheric fissure here. So you can see how it's really adhesed within the fissure. I'm dissecting the back fundus free. And once I have that, I can go on with this first clip. So I've got a fenestrated clip here, and the idea is um, I'm going to fenestrate um, the A2 ipsilateral. So you can see the A2 coming through the fenestration. And then I'm going to apply a second stacked fenestration just because you got to get the heel uh, or the, this in this case, an angled um, short fenestrated clip to close that little portion of aneurysm that's above the heel. So it's a, it's a combination of two intersecting Fenny clips. And uh, um, just shows you the superiorly projecting aneurysm. Now this next one um, here, uh, I believe is a posteriorly projecting aneurysm. You can see um, a mini crany. Um, here's the aneurysm. You can see how it uh, projects posteriorly and back here. Let me go back. And, Yeah, so um, here you can see um, uh, in this one, not only does it sort of project really straight up, but you can see how the A2s uh, are really far in front of it. So it ends up being posteriorly placed. And if you look really carefully, this one actually had an accessory uh, A3. So you'll see, if you count them, you've got three A3s coming out. So uh, here's the view subfrontally. You can see the A2s coming in. Sorry, the A1's coming in. Here's recurrent artery of Huebner. So I'm going to place a clip here on the contralateral um, A1 and the ipsilateral A1. And that softens the aneurysm. Now I can sort of um, work my way around the corner. 
And um, you can see here, um, I've got, um, I've gone with a, an angled clip, which I'm working my way behind the A2s. I've angled the blades downward in between the two A2s. And you can see that by this downward right angle clip, I can slowly work the clip. You can see the blades in here. I'm just working it back. There's the, uh, the blades passing the distal neck right in that little space. And you can see how that's a really nice way for this posterior uh, aneurysm to fold in on itself. And then I use uh, an intersecting mini clip to get this little dog ear uh, remnant underneath. And here you can see the contralateral A2. We've got a, uh, one of the A2s coming off the A1 there. And the ipsilateral A1 here. So really, com uh, really complex and unusual anatomy there, just showing how that posteriorly projecting aneurysm took a, uh, a downward right angle clip. Uh, this is another one. Um, this is a, uh, another posteriorly projecting aneurysm, right side. We're coming in uh, over the optic nerve here. This is the contralateral optic nerve. You can see a very small A1 on the opposite side. And here, as you look at this aneurysm, if this was all you knew about this, you might think that that's it. But if you look behind uh, the ACOM complex in this junctional triangle here, uh, you can see that yellow atherosclerotic lobe that really is the bulk of this aneurysm. So here, once again, I'm using a, a temporary clip. I'm going over the shoulder of the current artery of Huebner, which is here. And um, the aneurysm here is uh, very adherent to the contralateral A2. This is the contralateral A2. There's a little band here, which I'm cutting. It's uh, just a fibrotic band there. And by releasing that, that perforator in the back comes free. And you see here, this is a fenestrated clip. Let me um, back that up. That's a, a fenestrated clip that goes around the ipsilateral A2. You can see recurrent artery of Huebner uh, right in there, right in the fenestration coming down. And you can see that that first clip does a nice job of closing the majority of the neck. And then this second fenestrated clip stacks on top I use the heel of that second clip to close the near portion of the neck. And uh, you can see nicely how that tube transmits the ipsilateral A2. The contralateral A2 is seen there. And we do our IC green here to, uh, to uh, confirm. So this is just uh, showing uh, these antegrade tubes. The antegrade tubes, they're a stack of Fenny clips. The flow goes through the branch vessel, the heels of these blades close this surface of the, um, of the aneurysm. It's almost like a right angle clip here, except you're using each clip to make, um, well, the first clip to close across the neck and each subsequent clip, just the, um, the contact of the heel to close this little sliver of the aneurysm. Um, so another case, um, another ACOM, there you see, um, projecting kind of anteriorly. This is the view you get. Uh, it's got sort of a multi-lobulated dome here. And um, once again, a little temporary clip down the stretch to soften this. There's the contralateral A2. Looking across, you can see um, some little branches to the medial hemisphere. I'm gonna go on here first with a um, uh, a pilot clip nicely across and then um, a little dog ear uh, remnant uh, here is addressed with that intersecting clip and this one because it was thick walled um, had a lot of life to it the pulsation in the dome just wouldn't uh, wouldn't die so you can see how you just keep adding booster clips as ne necessary to close that down and there I see green just uh, confirms that we've got uh, uh, patency there. And here just a little um, MCA. I think that's an MCA that we took care of on the way out or maybe a PCOM. Yeah, it's PCOM. All right. And then uh, this one, um, this is a um, recurrent uh, 
aneurysm, um, I believe it was after coiling, um, and uh, presented with a subarachnoid hemorrhage. So here you can see a um, different story when they're ruptured, obviously a lot more um, challenging because you've got some blood in the fissure, the anatomy is buried. And here uh, we're coming on the aneurysm. So here's our hot aneurysm. This is the contralateral A1, which I'm uh, clipping for um, softening of the aneurysm. And here, working my way behind the aneurysm. And you can see how this is an anteriorly projecting aneurysm. So we use just a simple straight clip. You can see the contralateral A2 in there. The ipsilateral A2 is up here. And then uh, this one needed a little booster clip at the base because of the coils. And you can see um, nice uh, patency of the vessels here with IC green. So another um, PCOM aneurysm found on the way out. And uh, let's see. Uh, I'll finish with this one. This is a um, uh, residual ACOM aneurysm after uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage. You can see here. Uh, in this case, um, coiled, ruptured during the coiling procedure, and what do you do? Uh, this was referred uh, after the complication, and you can see um, just um, the, uh, the, the complex there, the coils herniating out the dome. You can see them sticking in the subarachnoid space. And so for this one, I'm going to trap the complex completely, and um, this is how not to take coils out. You don't want to pull them one at a time, it's far better just to open the dome and to uh, mobilize the, co the, the coil mass upward like I'm showing here. So you can see that um, in an acute setting, you can just pull the coils up and out of the aneurysm sac rather than pulling it strand by strand. And once you have the aneurysm now returned to its soft pre-clipping state or pre-coiling state, you can get that um, aneurysm uh, in your blades nicely. You can close the, the, the dome here. And then this is just an accessory lobe sticking forward that I use a little stack of, um, of uh, straight clips here to, uh, to tailor. I can come off now with the temporary clips. And you see uh, very nicely how um, um, that takes care of the problem. So uh, more and more, we're seeing these uh, coil recurrences at the ACOM, and uh, this is one solution. Uh, obviously, in the acute setting, it's a lot easier to extract and remove the mass. Um, I'll show you in this next case an example of a more chronic uh, situation where um, it's, it's far more difficult to, uh, to take care of that. Once again, uh, an, ex uh, an extra aneurysm in the MCA on the way out. Uh, so this will be my last case. Um, this is a, um, you can see here, uh, a coiled uh, aneurysm. It was um, a recurrent aneurysm. It was coiled a second time uh, and even a third time. So it was finally referred uh, in about um, two and a half years uh, for clipping after multiple uh, retreatments here. And you can see um, what happens when they're more chronic. They stick to the wall very difficult to free the coil mass. And so um, even with some sharp dissection here, it's very difficult to completely uh, restore that aneurysm to its pre-coiling state where it's nice and soft. So you'll see here, I'm gonna take um, as much of this that I can take out safely. You don't wanna damage the tissue here at the neck and have nothing to work with for the clip reconstruction. So I'm gonna leave it at this completely open the aneurysm here. It's, it's trapped with temporary clips. But now you can see that even with that little bit of coil there, things are soft. And I can go on with this tandem clip construct with the fenestrated clip 
first, a closing clip on top of that, and then a little uh, clip within the fenestration here to finish the closure. And so here um, you can see the view at the end. You'll also notice on this one, it's an example of a uh, accessory A2. You'll see uh, one You'll see uh, three A3, uh, three A2 is one, two, and three. So all three are filling there. Uh, but again, you got to make sure that you identify that uh, going in. Otherwise, you're going to miss it. So um, those are the points I wanted to make on ACOMs. Um, these are just some pictures of different uh, ACOMs. You can see the, the theme here is variability. You've got variability in the anatomy. You've got variability in the dome projection. You've got um, variability in the size. So uh, you really see an incredible spectrum of aneurysms um, with, uh, with these uh, ACOM aneurysms. And so um, you just have to be ready for anything. So uh, I thank you. I'm going to exit and stop my share. And there thank we have you, it, Mike. 5.30 on the nose. OK. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's a great uh, overview and illustration of good cases, which is, like you said, this is one of the bread and butter of uh, aneurysms and uh, aneurysm surgery, and uh, they frequently present with ruptures. And uh, I think uh, the, the last two cases illustrate a good point. Uh, these aneurysms are more and more seen to have grown and recur and they became very complex and a good uh, surgical clipping is 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 a more durable uh, treatment all right well, i'll go ahead and get started and uh, Can you see my screen? Yeah, it's not moving at all. You start again, restart. Uh, I haven't, uh, okay. Uh, can you see it going forward? No, it's not going forward, not moving at all. Okay. Okay, yeah, restart, yeah. Can so, you see it now? Yeah, I can see it. That's a video, right? No. No, it's not a picture. No, it's not full it's size. Picture. It's a picture, right? Okay. Yeah, we see the we see the picture. Okay. okay. All right. Well, um, this is just to remind me to tell a lot of our uh, listeners. Uh, pretty soon, we'll restart our courses uh, in our institution and uh, hopefully we'll see a lot of you visiting with us uh, in our facility. So uh, I think Michael clearly uh, indicated the anatomy and the uh, importance of knowing all the details of it. This is from Yazergil's book that illustrates uh, uh, all the branches that you should be familiar with them in order to operate in this region. Say that, Ahmad. I don't know. Are you advancing the slide? Yes. Uh, it's not moving? Uh, no, it's not moving. OK, I'll try again then. Okay. Still the reconstruction slide. I think he may have fallen off. He'll be he'll be back. He'll be back. Okay. Oh, there you go. Go ahead. Try again. There you go. 
Perfect. Okay. So can you see this picture? The uh, yes. The arteries. Okay. So, yes. as I mentioned, this is uh, from Yazergil's book, and uh, Michael uh, also uh, showed it very nicely uh, from pictures from his book, illustrating the importance of knowing this anatomy. And as he said. You know, you have to be very familiar with where these branches are because when you start encountering them, especially when you have a bloody field, you have to assume that they are present. Otherwise, you'll you'll end up with more trouble. This is an example. Again, Yazergil has showed so many variations, and the importance of knowing the variations is really how to get yourself ahead of the game. And this is an example of Heubner variations. You can see how many different possibilities, but this is the more common scenario where you have one coming from the A1, A2 junction, but sometimes you may have early ones and you may not pay attention if you assume only Heubner comes from here. And as you are dissecting, especially in a bloody field, you may end up coagulating a Heubner without you knowing. And that's why it's important to know those variations, as well as the many variations which he put in his book and uh, the nice pictures that Michael showed also, which are uh, the different fenestrations that you may encounter and the location of these uh, um, uh, variations. Also, there's a lot of variations in the perforators as well as in the A2, as you have seen here, the azagus type, et cetera. So I won't repeat much from what Michael said. This was, uh, uh, Yazergil showed this correlating with the angiogram. When the patient is laying down on the angiogram, what's anterior in, in real life becomes superior in, in angiogram and in surgery. Those are the different locations of these aneurysms. Um, this is the anterior type. Michael showed uh, several cases in this area. This is more superior type. The superiority of this is in the fact that when you come surgically, it looks like it's projecting superior. So this is, even though it's more anteriorly located, but it's superior when it comes to the surgical view. And that's important to know because you have to make your plans. For example, in this case, uh, as again, Michael alluded to it, you want to be prepared to find your opposite A2. And if it is projecting anteriorly, you may have to come from the posterior aspect, remove part of gyrus rexus to get to it. Sometimes this may not even show it. Sometimes what I have done, I took a lo long clip and put it on both the A1 on the opposite side and the neck, which acts like a temporary clip, then clean around and then put your clip again. This is the posterior type, which is usually more into the interhemispheric fissure, and the inferior type, which is more posteriorly located. And, and this one is the one that you have to watch for the perforators. And then all different types of complexity uh, comes out. So in terms of exposure, it's very important. And if you look at the first paragraph in Yazergil's book, he describes the approach removal of the sphenoid wing and opening uh, the uh, space to get to that region. This is a beautiful picture from his book that shows how this tunnel, which is very tight, you can barely see the area of the optic nerve. If you retract, you may see more, but if you take the bone out in this picture, then you can come down to this area without any retraction. And that's the whole concept of approaching these aneurysms because they are really in the basal region. So this is the view that you want to get and you need to get this view but without any retraction so you can get down to this. At the end, once you do some resection of the gyrus rexus if need be, and you can gently put a retractor to, to hold the brain and not to push the brain in a way, so you can get a full view of the whole complex to get the anatomy done. Now, important points to keep in mind, uh, just like middle cerebral artery aneurysms, anterior communicating artery aneurysm base is also wide. This is a picture which 
I kind of took it and modified it from professor's book. It shows the underbelly that you can miss. The reason is this is hidden behind the A1, A2 junction. So when you're coming in your approach, you may not be able to see this and you may drop your clip feeling like you have done a good job unless you look and sometimes you have to look from behind the A1, A2 junction. And I'll show some so that you can see well uh, the things. Otherwise, if you don't, it can grow over time and that can bleed and become a problem later. The other thing is I kind of follow the same concept with very complex aneurysms. I like to reconstruct it and simplify them. I'll show some pictures of it because this will allow you to take all the hidden and the blind spots from around the aneurysm when you finish clipping them. These are nice examples shown and I'll show similar cases in from Yazerg's book. So uh, another point to make, do not underestimate any uh, ACOM aneurysms, no matter how small they are. I know in the international study of unruptured aneurysms, they mentioned small aneurysms, anterior circulation, you can watch them. I will never watch a small ACOM. And this is a good example. If you look at this here, you will not see except a little blister and look at the massive bleed that occurred in this case. And the other thing is uh, ACOM when they bleed, they are serious bleeders and they really change those patients. Look at the amount of blood they have. They change their, their behavior, their, their uh, memory problems due to the injury in the hypothalamic and septal region. And the best time to take care of them is is before they bleed. So have a low threshold to deal with these aneurysms. Now, the approach in my case, I because of over time, I realized that I really need to be very low as much as possible. So I evolved to where, uh, especially that in, in very difficult brains, it is, it's swollen and um, you have to kind of come down to to uh, that region and, and you may need some retraction. So as Yazergil said, I drill the sphenoid wing, but I take it one further step, expose more in the, uh, in the area of the, uh, sub of the uh, orbital frontal region. And I take part of the orbital roof and then I put a stitch and pull the orbit in a way out of the way. The reason is I want that you will see the view I get here, and this is the view you get. And in this case, you don't have to open the dura much because all your surgery is done under the brain, but you got all the space created in this area. So the view is, is enough and wide because you can do a lot of work um, on, on the brain and the sylvian fissure, but if you did not take the bone, you're still gonna be hindered. and. It's interesting that Yazergil was, the first sentence he mentioned was how to expose these aneurysms. So in this case, uh, you can see the, the wide aspect of the base. And then once you get to that point, you see the exposure that we do is, again, it's a small space. And this is a, as I will start with a small aneurysm and go to higher complexity. And, uh, and that's the space you want to see. You want to see the proximal aspect of the sylvian fissure and the whole supra optic region. So that by the time you look up, you see that I'm opening the interhemispheric uh, fissure and I have a lot of space. And the more you come from inferior to superior, you have you end up taking much less gyrus rectus. You can see the complex is starting to show up, and I haven't taken yet any gyrus rectus. In the past, I would have to take a little more, but once I get more pretemporal and subfrontal, I'm coming from a more lateral position. The other advantage here is when I put my retractor, the dura, because it's here it prevents me from retracting too much. And that 
also protects the brain. You can see that you can barely see any brain except around the area where we need to operate on. Now, this is an example where I am looking behind the A1, A2 complex because this aneurysm was projecting superiorly, but it has an, a posterior part. If you clip it from one side, from anterior, you have a view, it will look like a small aneurysm. But in reality, this is a more involved aneurysm, which has a posterior underbelly. And that's why when you apply your clip, you have to be able to see better. The other thing is look at the perforators here. These are the, the hypothalamic perforators. Injury to those perforators is going to cause the patient problems with short-term memory and uh, you you have to take you have to treat them just like like any other important perforators do not underestimate them and if there is one that looks flimsy do not underestimate it so you can see the view you get on the posterior aspect so now i understand very well my anatomy this is a1 on the opposite side a1 on this side this is the a1 or A2 on the ipsilateral side. This is the A2 on the opposite side. And this is ACOM here. So you can see the aneurysm. I can clip it either from here or from the anterior side in this case. Some of them you can only clip them from one side in a way. So next is to uh, put a clip that will include the whole base on both anterior and posterior part. In this case, we put, we ended up putting a J clip, but notice at the rotation of the clip, it goes more posterior in order to include the other side. So when we started, if you remember, this looks like a small blister from this side, but you can see how much aneurysm is included into that. Another thing is this is a small aneurysm with wide base and look how blistery it is. This is why you should not underestimate ACOM aneurysms. So by the time we finish, you can see I'm looking at the perforators. There is no residual aneurysm. And the aneurysm in this case is completely clipped. And this is after coagulating it. And as you notice, the window is very small, very small. So you don't have to see much of the brain. Same, another case, an ACOM aneurysm. And this is the point to show that these aneurysms, uh, sorry. These aneurysms are not always amenable to, to uh, coiling. This is a small aneurysm. And again, the view through a small window. And when we expose it, you will see the the blistery part of it, you see that? It's similar to the other one. And this aneurysm did not look any impressive on the CT angiogram preoperatively. Now, I am putting a temporary clip. You may say, well, I can clip it without a temporary clip, which is true. However, a lot of times when you have a wide base, small blistery aneurysm, when you put your clip, it tends to slide and you won't be able to see well around it. So in this case, I'm looking at the underbelly posteriorly. And at the same time, the softness of the aneurysm, when it is blistery, it will allow your clip to get a much better purchase when you apply it in place. And you can see here, you can push down on the base but if it is strong, filled with blood, and you apply the clip without a temporary clip, a lot of times it will slide away from the base. And that's why the advantage of putting a temporary clip. And now this one is another thing. Do not underestimate an acute severe headache in a patient. If you look at this case, it looks like a little bulge. This patient has an acute headache. Her CTA look, showed this, CT was negative, and her LP, lumbar puncture, was negative. And it just, the picture was so impressive in, in clinically that we looked at it, and, and she's young, 
She has history of hypertension and I could not underestimate it. So we told her we can explore it or we can keep an eye on it. Fortunately, she said, no, I would rather, I know something happened. Now look at the anatomy. This is after uh, opening and cleaning uh, the uh, area around the aneurysm. And look at this, this is, this is the aneurysm and it has a little pseudo aneurysm coming on top of it. So this really ruptured, it did bleed, even though the symptoms were very unimpressive in a way. So I'll just go to show you after putting the clip, you can see how there is like a little scab on top of the aneurysm. So now taking those aneurysms that can grow, how do they look like? This is an example of an aneurysm which has a posterior bulge. And if you look carefully at this picture, you can see the main aneurysm, but you can see the bulge behind it. So it's important that you close not only the anterior part, but also the posterior part to be included. So this is an example. It's the same. If you notice, I don't, in my cases, see much of the brain. I just open more widely into the middle fossa and uh, remove the sphenoid wing aggressively and sometimes with anteriorly projecting aneurysm I may remove the clinoid so I can see things well and you can see immediately I get proximal control I get to the A1 and and it continued uh, like Michael said you always find A1 and follow it towards the complex now one point to mention when I find A1 on this side it gives me a clue where the other A1 one way to think about it is it correlates with its relationship to the lamina terminalis. And lamina terminalis usually is at the level where the aneurysm is. And why I'm saying that, because you have to be aware of variations. Some patients have very long optic nerve. And when it is long, then the, the A1 is longer and it's going more posterior. And you may have difficulty finding the opposite A1. And this is one way to guide yourself, especially when you have a field which is full of blood. Look at the right A1, see where it's located compared to the chiasm and the lamina terminalis and correlate it with the other side. So here I'm putting a clip on both. And then if you look here, you see the underbelly on the posterior side. You need to include this. If you don't include it, it will grow. And those are important things. Otherwise, you will be missing on a lot. But again, look at how much exposure I have. And I didn't except have a small opening in the dura. The reason is I am coming from a completely different route and at the same time, I'm creating a space more on the temporal side. And the temporal lobe is not in my way anymore. It just retracts with a small, uh, small uh, tack-up stitch. Now, I put a cottonoid here to push the tissue around it. And I put the first clip. And you will notice, even though I am trying to get a purchase of that bulge behind the clip, thinking, well, this clip will be enough. But look in a second, you see that? Even my effort, I left a small part of the areas. So in this case, I will put another clip under this one, which is curved, and that will take care of it. That's one way to do it. Or you may have to start with a curved clip, but I like to, when I put this clip, I use it to be a shelf to push the next clip that you see the residual down here. This clip is curved and it goes down to get a full purchase of the aneurysm. And then in this case, you will end up with no residual and no chance of growth. This is the, the beauty of 
of the, you see, you can see here, the clip is completely included. The beauty of doing the surgery in a, in a try to get as perfect clipping and full exposure is you, this is more durable and the chance of recurrence gets down to zero and you're curing this problem. Now they can get more complex and, and this is an example. This is a case which, uh, let me see if I can go back to it. Yeah. This is a case which has multilobular aspect to it. And you can see the aneurysm has more than three lobes in a way. And you can see how it looks. Now, one of the things that important for me is the distance between the dome of the aneurysm, if it's projecting anterior, and the planum sphenoidale, because this will tell you if you can see the opposite A1 or not. This distance will help me plan my uh, approach as well. Why? Because if, if it is a good distance, I know I can go from underneath and find the other A1 before I have to deal with the dome with the aneurysm. If it is not, you have to change your plan. You may have to come from above to go to the opposite side. And sometimes, like I mentioned, you may have to put the clip to include the opposite A2 and then put your second clip afterward. So all these are important things. And, uh, and occasionally, if you have a dominant left A1, A1, then you may have to come from the left side. So let's take examples. This is a quite large aneurysm, but at the same time, to me, there is not much complexity in it, and you will see why. One, the posterior uh, bulge in it is not too bad. If you look at it, the mostly it's anterior, but the posterior bulge is manageable you can see it between the two. And there is a good distance between the two A2s. The other thing is look at the distance between the planum sphenodale and the aneurysm. That means I can go to the opposite side and find A1. So I'm secure. I have both A1s. I just have to find the A2s and then I will be able to clip the aneurysm. Again, the approach is similar. Open the proximal sylvium fissure and find the A1 and then follow it. There is an, an avascular arachnoid plane between the uh, A1 and the um, optic nerve. Make sure this is the case. If you see any branches which look like they're bridging or coming down, do not coagulate them. This could be Heubner. Sometimes there are direct perforators that come from the A1 to the chiasm, you try to save them as well. You don't want to injure any of those. Again, you see, this is the opening. I can go the opposite side, even though this is a big aneurysm, but the distance between the, the planum sphenoidale and the aneurysm was wide. So I know the aneurysm is high. This will need some more resection of uh, part of the gyrus rectus. And now I can see the aneurysm this is the first temporary clip over the opposite A1. And then another clip on the ipsilateral A1. And look how important to put the clips in a way they're not in the way of the neck of the aneurysm. And then there is a branch here, which is over the aneurysm. If you watch carefully, I did not cut it. It's a small frontal orbital branch. Now I'm coagulating the aneurysm and I am reshaping it, shrinking it down because I need to see the opposite A2. And that's what I'm looking at. You see that? You can see start the branches on the opposite side and feeling the aneurysm away from it. Actually, this is a frontal orbital branch. It was lower. This is from the anterior part Again, visualizing the takeoff. And now as I coagulate and soften the aneurysm, you can see the opposite A2. This is one place where the clip is gonna go. And there is another place on the other side 
where the clip is going to go. I'm shrinking the aneurysm, making it smaller. This is the A2 on the opposite side. So I already simplified the aneurysm to a smaller uh, base. And now I'm looking on the opposite side here. That's the takeoff of A2. Now, this is important to do. You have to create a three-dimensional picture in your mind so that when you put your clips, now my clips have eyes because I can see where my clip is going and I am feeling it. So one clip is going above the, uh, here, the A2, and the other one is going, this is A2, and the clip drops in that little crotch between the aneurysm and the A2. You can see this is the A2 on the opposite side here. And then I will look on the other side and you can see the A2 as well. We take the temporary clips and then you can finish reconstruction. Now, in those sclerotic aneurysms, it's important not to go home before you make sure that the aneurysm is not filling. Because like you will notice now, I'm putting another clip and I will check the aneurysm in a second. And I'll find out that it's still bleeding. So then I coagulated and I put another clip. In this case, it was just three straight clips from the bottom to the top. And that usually made a complex aneurysm really simple to clip in a way. And then take the temporary clips off. And, uh, and you can see the aneurysm here. That's the opposite A2. The other epsilator A2 is here. Aneurysm and everything is clean. Now, this one is a ruptured aneurysm. And I wanted to show steps that you should do when how to deal with rupture. This is a case which would, I can show you now. I barely touched the dome of the aneurysm, and it just bled in a way. And there is an, another MCA aneurysm in this case. So this is the way it looks. It has like one ball here and another ball here. I was hoping to achieve this. And eventually I do, but you will see how I reconstruct it. So this is an acute rupture. Again, look at the advantage here. I have not much of the brain exposed. I open the basal cistern and I go directly, try to go to the lamina terminalis. Sometimes you may have to open the, uh, to put a ventriculostomy if you feel like you're hindered from it. So this is A1 on the right side. And I am dissecting now, barely dissecting the, I opened lamina terminalis, got spinal fluid out. And then look what I, I barely did anything. You see, and it started bleeding. So what are the steps to do now? First thing is you let all the blood should always go to the suction, nothing, no, nowhere else. I take a larger suction. You train your nurses how to do it. You take a larger suction on the right side because I'm, um, and then to make sure that you're catching up with the bleeding because I don't know yet where is it coming from. But I, you have to remember the last thing you did when this occurred. And then take another larger suction so that you can free your right hand again, which will catch up with the bleeding. Okay, and then in this case, I looked carefully at it. You don't wanna try to clip. You don't wanna try to disturb things. I looked at it and I could see a small hole. And then in this case, I just took a piece of gel foam and gently, don't push hard, gently put it on it and, and then put a piece of cotton and then put a little gentle pressure and wait. A lot of times this is helpful. Now, even though I'm showing you this, I really uh, ask my research uh, uh, PhD to look at our numbers. In ACOM aneurysms, we have 1% uh, 
of premature rupture like this. We have oozing that occurs. So now the dissection is continued. I went to the gyrus rectus. The aneurysm rupture is down here. And now I have to go around the aneurysm to expose it. So then once we get there, this is the view you get. This is where the cotton is. This is where the bleeding is. So here's what you have. This is right optic nerve, A1 on this side, A2. I expose the aneurysm. I don't see the opposite side yet, A1. I could see the A2 on this side. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to put a clip and then clip the rupture site. So this aneurysm, if you remember, has one dome like this, another one going between the two optic nerves. I want to secure the bleeding site. So this is what we're gonna do. We put an, a clip on the A1, and then I am putting a clip on the bleeding part. Oops, sorry. Okay, so we're doing a clip on the bleeding part. And then I will expose quickly to the opposite side to find the other A2. This is to secure it more. And now I'll go further to the other side and cutting the bleeding part and now I'm looking for the opposite A1. And now I have an unruptured aneurysm. The rest of it is reconstruction of the aneurysm. And I'll show you the final results here. This is the, I put a temporary clip. We have one clip here and another one to include the underbelly. You see, it became like an unruptured case. And that's what you should always think in a situation of rupture. You stay calm, remember what the last thing you did and try to control it. And this will be the last clip to include the, the base. This was going circumferentially around the bifurcation. And that's the, the final result in a way. So you can see the reconstruction. Now going forward, this is a multilobular one. And uh, just to show the reconstruction in this case, so this aneurysm is also shrunken down to see the opposite A2. You see, that's the opposite A2. You can simplify these aneurysms. Don't be scared from them. Again, I've always said, do not be scared from aneurysms. Aneurysms should be scared from you. That's how it should be. You should feel comfortable. And now I'm dissecting the aneurysm. You see how it's multilobular, but this is a great technique introduced by Professor Yazergil. A lot of people feel nervous about using it. But if you master how to use it, you can see everything well. And now you can see the anatomy well. And then we have to go on and reconstruct it. That's how the aneurysm complex looks. And then we reconstructed it. And then once we finished, I'll show you how it looked. This is how it looked first. And then we put a tandem clips and that's how it finished. So just to show the reconstruction aspect of it. Again, similar complex case. 
This is one interesting case that I'd show. This is an inferiorly projecting uh, clip, which was not easy to to clip because it's away from us. And you can see the picture of it. Now, the problem with it here is, and I'll show you, when we opened and looked at the aneurysm, it was projecting the other way. This is the view we got. The aneurysm is projecting away from us. However, at this takeoff here, there was a perforator here. You can see the perforator is draped over the aneurysm. So we have to avoid including it. So we used a fenestrated clip, but when I tried to go beyond it, it kept pinching the artery. So you really need an opening around where the artery is coming off. So in this case, what I ended up doing is we, we drilled the, I'll show you one second here. When we put the clip, the takeoff was always here. It was not, we couldn't avoid this artery here. So in that case, I decided to take the, this off and then drill the, the clip itself, create a, a fenestration for the small perforator. You have to do it carefully not to weaken the uh, clip. And then we applied the clip in place. And you can see now the perforator is filling because we drilled the, uh, the clip. So and then when we did the ICG, the aneurysm is closed. This is where the aneurysm comes and you can see the perforator between the clips here that's filling. So, and that's how it looked. This is how the perforator looked. And this is how it looked originally before putting the clip. So, I think there is there's a lot of examples. We're we're running out of time. I kind of um, there's many things. I want to show one case only before we finish of another very difficult situation. This is good learning case, and in this case, this patient has a left uh, the left side internal carotid is closed and the right side is the one that's open. And this caused a, a hemodynamic stress aneurysm of the ACOM. And this patient had a sentinel episode suggestive that she bled from it. So we looked at it, we saw it, and we said, let's explore it and see what it is. And let me show you just to go to it. This is the, the left A1. This is the ACOM, and I'm trying to see, look how, how ugly these blisters are. And I'm wondering what would be the best way to clip them. We don't want to leave them. They cannot be coiled. And you can see every time I try to dissect, it kind of bleeds. So I try to put, I thought I'll put in, into this aneurysmal blister a clip and then I can maybe wrap this one. And notice what happened when I try to do that. 
and I was kind of reluctant. The minute I closed the clip, it started bleeding. I realized then, and that's what happened. So in that case, I have to catch up with the bleeding. So you get another suction. You, And one of the things I do always is I zoom out because it makes the blood look less. It's kind of fastest way of decreasing the blood in a way. So then I take the other suction. Notice I am keeping my eye on the source and I have to remember what was the last thing I've done. So I take a large suction and put it at the hole and I pushed a little bit just to make sure the blood is coming only to the uh, suction. It's okay, the bleeding, nobody is, if you have in good control, nobody will die from exsanguination from an aneurysm. It, it is what you do is the problem. So in this case, I took another larger suction on the left side. You see, and you have to train your staff to do this. And now I am forced, I tried not to use a temporary clip, but now I have no choice. I, the reason I wanted to not use the temporary clip because she had only one carotid, but obviously she has good flow. So now what to do? It's not easy to clip this. And this again shows you the, the power of bipolar coagulation. If you know how to use the bipolar, you can really get yourself out of a sticky situation because this is not a clippable aneurysm. So in this case, we went down to this point and coagulated it. And that's how it looked. Then we put some cotton on top of it. And that's how it looked at the end. So, so I'll stop here and, um, you know, to stress one thing, this is our results of unruptured aneurysms. You can see the patients, uh, at discharge, 82% are independent on follow-up, 99%. These patients do very well. And again, credit goes a lot to Professor Yazagil for, for really guiding us through all these things. Please read his books. He has tons of information which is useful for these aneurysms. He has figured them out 40 years ago. So I'll stop here now. Very good. Thank you, Dr. Krishna. Ahmad, do you want to pick out the appropriate questions? That yes, you... yes. Uh, we have a question. Any comment about interhemispheric approaches to ACAM aneurysm? Yeah. I, uh, I know our colleagues in Japan have used it. I have seen it, been exposed. Uh, it is, you know, one way to do it, uh, if you're used to it, it does have a, a long distance and in ruptured cases, it can be uh, kind of very sticky. The only thing is a lot of times you're landing down on the dome of the aneurysm. So that's, that could be a problem. Um, uh, I, I cannot comment on it. I don't myself feel comfortable. Uh, because of my experience with this approach, you can see the, uh, the advantage here is we are getting proximal control very early. And uh, that's one big plus. And uh, however, I am sure, you know, I have seen, I've read about it and uh, it's like a lot of things when you get a lot of experience, you, you have your tricks and you know how to deal with it. Another question from Dr. Uh, Barrick. What is the time limit for temporary clip, uh, temporary occlusion? Yeah. And do you use any uh, neuroprotective agent? Yeah. I, I myself don't use neuroprotective agents because I don't like to give myself the sense of security that, okay, I have birth suppression, barbiturate, so I can take my time. I don't like to feel like this. Uh, I usually 
when I have control situation, I put the temporary clips and usually within like uh, two minutes, the nurse will tell me, you know, if the aneurysm is filling and it has blood in it, it means there is good collateral flow, especially in young people. And you feel like you need another 30 minutes or I mean, 30 seconds or another minute or two to finish the job, you can continue finishing it. If the patient has an aneurysm which completely collapsed, and uh, Michael, Dr. Lotto mentioned that last time, this is an ominous sign in terms of temporary clip, but the advantage also, it collapses the clip. So it kind of has a positive and a negative. The positive is, is you can do faster the, the clipping, but the negative is you don't have much time because you don't have good backflow. But you can do on and off clipping, uh, temporary clips for many times, as long as you do not, uh, you know, stay for too long. And one thing to give advice is, I put the temporary clips on and off three, four, five times in order to build a three dimensional picture in my mind. And I have a perfect plan or, or an efficient plan when I'm clipping the aneurysm. So that when, by, by fragmenting these temporary clipping, it gives me a good idea what I'm gonna do. So when I commit to clipping the aneurysm, I don't have to spend much time. And that's by coagulating, shrinking the aneurysm, looking around, and then you need much less time. So in a way, instead of putting the clip one time, and then you start trying to clip, and then all of a sudden you have a sticky situation and it takes longer, no. Put temporary clips, go around, look around, understand it, shrink it down, simplify it, and then take the clips off. If you need to do it more, do it. Eventually, your brain will, will kind of light a bulb. You say, okay, I'm ready. The other advantage of doing this is you have your, your nurse kind of give you clips many times so that you warm them up and you also warm up in a way. You go in and out because you, you kind of master the movements in this specific field in a way. Now, I do use somatosense evoke potentials and EEG, and if there is any change in them, I take them seriously because they, there are indicators for cutting down the time on the temporary clips. I'm not sure. Uh, is uh, Dr. Lawton still there? I don't think he is. Uh, does genetics or genetics syndromes associated with aneurysm cause any change in strategy or alter the uh, approach? No. It's the same approach, same everything. The only thing I will mention is uh, Patients who have uh, who are who use drugs like cocaine, meth, and so forth, they have more blistery aneurysms. Their arteries are more abnormal, and you have to be careful because sometimes uh, any manipulation around the wall can cause easily an injury to it. The other thing to keep in mind: patients who are HIV positive have very abnormal vessel walls. Any place you touch it, it can become an aneurysm itself immediately in front of your eyes. Okay, anything make you prefer the left or right approach to HACOM aneurysm? Um, I use the right. I looked at Professor Yazigil uses the right. I know Michael is left-handed, so he probably feel comfortable even if he has to come from the left. Just out of comfort, I use the right. And I know how to find the opposite side. The big challenge is when you have a large aneurysm anteriorly projecting and closing the opposite side, a, a two, I mean, a one. In those cases, it may be very helpful to take the uh, orbital rim and extend the opening to the midline so you can go beyond the aneurysm along the planus funodale to the opposite side and try to put your clip there or even put the clip on the carotid, you may be able to see it. That's the one advantage. The other way to 
bypass this is to remove the gyrus rectus uh, cortex, small area, and go on top of the aneurysm. But if the aneurysm is bulging anteriorly and posteriorly, then and the A1s are equal on both sides, then you know it doesn't matter. But if the A1 is uh, large on the left side and the whole view is obstructed, large and complex, this would be a case to do it on the left side. Or if a patient has an associated aneurysm on the left side, then you can save the patient another craniotomy in order. Uh, when do you see it's necessary to uh, uh, make a DSA or angiograph? Well, I rarely really need it, especially with the ICG nowadays. I rarely use it. I haven't used it in a long, long time. Well, I mean, so, pre-op. Pre, pre, pre oh, pre-op. Yeah. Well, uh, nowadays with CTA, it's becoming less and less commonly used. Uh, the only time I would use it is if, uh, if I feel like... Uh, the aneurysm may be thrombosed and we're not able to see the anatomy well. It's usually very large aneurysms, partially thrombosed. If uh, in those cases, uh, I do an MRI and an angiogram to be able to see what I'm dealing with to be prepared. So sometimes you may have to prepare for a bypass as well. And you... Also, yeah. if there is some stenosis or narrowing in those segments that you're worried about, uh, you know, the, the pathology you're dealing with. Uh, like these uh, ACOM aneurysms, so how, how much is the incidence of developing a secondary normal pressure hydrocephalus in such aneurysms post-surgery? And do you deal with them in the regular manner as to deal with the NPH? Um, in regard to the hydrocephalus, in about 20 to 30% of patients will develop hydrocephalus acutely. And I'm, you know, we usually put an EVD and more recently I have been putting the EVD and using it to even inject TPA to wash out blood, decrease the chance of, of uh, spasm. Now, if you're asking how many of those patients we see in a delayed fashion, with a normal pressure hydrocephalus, like a slow growing, uh, you know, hydrocephalus over two to three weeks, um, it, it varies when, uh, the way I look at it is when the patient uh, needed an external ventricular drain and were able to wean it off uh, and we send them to rehab, then I make a point to get a follow-up scan in two to three weeks uh, and I warned the rehab doctors to watch for signs of normal pressure hydrocephalus. I, I hope I answered your question. Yeah. Oh, they, there's still some questions in the chat, so please. Now, uh, the other question is, do you recommend or have you ever used adenosine, adenosine your, during intraoperative? Rupture. Uh, I did not. Uh, I have prepared a couple of times. I ended up managing. Uh, I do a lot of wide exposure, so uh, I plan my exposure very early for temporary clipping. There was there was one case I can tell you. It's a PCOM aneurysm which uh, ruptured, uh, started bleeding, and uh, and we put a temporary clip and we realized that the carotid is calcified, both the clinoidal and the supraclinoid segment. And in that case, we wanted to use adenosine. What's interesting is the patient had a pacemaker. So we gave adenosine, the heart would not stop because the pacemaker will kick in. It was an interesting case. And then we ended up just clipping the aneurysm. So uh, I know Dr. Hernes Nemi Yuha has used it, and you can look up in, on the internet uh, a lot of cases that he put there in his uh, 1001 aneurysms. And, uh, but I have prepared it a few times uh, if I feel like there's potential sticky situation. 
It, it seems it works for those who have used it. I've never had to use it. I think I attribute that to going out of my way to get proximal control and exposures, which, you know, I use the skull base more. 